This is Argentina, a South American nation which has been home to an unprecedented period of sustained growth quintupling in size in the last decade. This nation has seen remarkable resilience through financial crises and even though it cycled through five presidents in two weeks, its continued reinvestment in itself has paid off many times over as average incomes have doubled in the same time period to create fantastic increases in quality of life for all of the citizens of the nation. Or at least, that would have been the video that we were making a few years ago. Unfortunately, today, the economy of Argentina tells a very different story. Just as quickly as the economy soared to these lofty heights, it has crashed back down, bringing about a period of heavy inflation and widespread poverty. But perhaps this shouldn't be a huge surprise. In the last 100 years, the economy of Argentina has been categorised by periods of massive growth followed by huge declines, making the most recent decades little more than a continuation of that unfortunate trend. This is a real shame, because Argentina obviously has a lot going for it. From a healthy population of productive workers, strong natural resource reserves, and even a landmass that is very conducive to foundational industries like manufacturing and agriculture. But despite all of these advantages, Argentina has time and time again fallen into this unfortunate pattern and is now teetering on the edge of becoming a full-blown failed state. Nobel Prize winning economist Simon Kuznets is said to have remarked in the early 1970s that there are four types of economies in the world. Developed, underdeveloped, Japan, and Argentina. We have already explored what makes Japan so weird, but to unravel the mystery of Argentina, we are going to have to understand a few specific issues. What has caused the various economic booms over the years? What has caused the subsequent economic declines? And why is this most recent downturn just a little bit different? Once we've done all of that, we can get to the fun stuff and put Argentina on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard. How's that for a 2020 Grand Final? This video is brought to you by Acorns, the investment platform trusted by over 8 million people, not to mention myself as well as the team here at Economics Explained. If your goal in 2021 is to build wealth, but say you don't have much to get started, or you just don't know where to begin, then you should definitely check out Acorns. Acorns makes it ridiculously easy to get started with investing. With features like Smart Deposit, you can automatically move a portion of your paycheck into your savings, investment and retirement accounts just by snapping a picture of your check or by setting up ACH Direct Deposits. And if that wasn't cool enough, you can also invest in your future with Roundups. Here's how it works. Simply link your existing debit or credit card into your Acorns app and then just spend as you normally would. Yep, that's all you gotta do. Next time you swipe your card or buy something online, Acorns will automatically round up the difference, putting aside that spare change right into your diversified portfolio. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you can also use your heavy metal Acorns debit card, but more on that at the end of this video. Feel free to sign up now at acorns.com ee and Acorns will deposit $5 into your investment account to help kickstart your portfolio. Again, that's acorns.com ee. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. It may sound unbelievable today, but at the turn of the 20th century, Argentina was one of the 10 wealthiest countries in the world. Its domestic industries, which revolved primarily around high-end agriculture, had benefited greatly from an influx of investment from Europe and America, and the nation was able to adopt modern commercial farming techniques. This worked especially well considering that those same countries that invested so heavily were also fantastic export markets who through their own economic growth had developed quite the taste for red meat, which before this time was seen as a bit of a luxury. This growth was further accelerated by massive European immigration into the nation, which brought with it even more money from people looking to set up their new lives. Overall, this was fantastic, and by 1905, the average Argentinian was about as wealthy as the average citizen of France, Britain or Germany, and only slightly poorer than the average American. There was a slight asterisk next to this success though, which was that the politicians and business leaders who oversaw this growth were extremely corrupt, and the wealth the nation was growing was being distributed very unevenly and went primarily to the aforementioned European immigrants. This wouldn't necessarily have been a problem in the long run because the nation was still getting wealthier and even people at the bottom were enjoying an increased standard of living, but of course, it didn't go on forever. World War I was, let's say, an interesting time for Argentina. The country remained totally neutral, but that does not mean that they were not heavily influenced by the fallout of the war. For starters, due to a massive influx of European immigrants, many of whom were from nations that were now at war with each other, it found its population was rather hostile. 
A much more tangible effect was that all of the nations that had been pumping investment capital into Argentina and buying up all of their exports were now broke on account of having to fight the largest and bloodiest war in history up until that time. This pushed the country into a long period of stagnation that was only worsened by the Great Depression in 1929. Luxuries like red meat on the dinner table and foreign investment quickly fell out of style. This was a real problem for the leadership of the nation. Not only were they no longer able to make themselves incredibly wealthy off the success of Argentina, but the people of the nation who were enjoying the secondhand wealth were becoming increasingly restless. A solution was needed and fast, so a series of trade deals were set up with European nations to try and reignite the growth of the previous decades. Unfortunately, these trade deals were very one-sided, and they served primarily to solve the issue of corrupt politicians not getting rich, rather than the problems of a nation losing its primary industries. The most famous example of such a deal gave Britain, with its asymmetrical flag here, exclusive rights to sell coal to Argentina, and also gave British companies the right to buy up and control the Argentinian meat industry. Sure, this gave the country a small boost in exports, which was very important, but it also gave away Argentina's primary industry to a foreign power, which was terrible. It was such a poorly planned out deal that corruption was really the only reason that leaders from Argentina would have been compelled to agree with such onerous terms. Either way, these deals further accelerated the decline of the nation, which gave rise to heightened civil unrest and a series of political coups. Political instability, resulting in the forceful removal of a government, is never a good look to the international community, and foreign investors in the nation quickly dried up. This was a real problem because at this time the nation was desperately trying to industrialise other sectors of the economy to make up for the meat industry which was increasingly falling into the hands of international companies. This eventually led to the election of Juan Perón, who introduced sweeping economic reforms with a particular interest on building out nationalised heavy industry, which sounds an awful lot like someone else you might know around this time period. For what it's worth, this tactic of nationalise everything that was owned by foreigners and pumping money into building out industry did sort of work for a while. But once other nations had recovered from the Second World War, they were very cranky that all of their foreign assets had been stolen. To add insult to injury, Argentina was more than happy to extend an open invitation to German Nazis that the world had just fought so hard to defeat. For this reason, nobody wanted to invest in Argentina or buy any of the stuff that they were making in their fancy new factories, and for a nation that was heavily dependent on exports and foreign investment, this was a major blow. The nation quickly became very poor once again, and the radical new leader's popularity fell along with it, leading to yet another political coup from a successive lineup of strong figurehead leaders with the secret solution to fix the nation. At this point, you should start to get an idea of the narrative of Argentina in the 20th century. Sweeping reforms to correct minor issues meant that more harm was done than good, and these damages were subsequently fixed by more sweeping reforms that did more harm than good. The nation ping-ponged its way through the remainder of the 20th century, pinging from total command economics to ponging off basic laissez-faire capitalism. Now any regular viewers on this channel will know what I'm going to say next. This kind of back and forth decimated the stability of the nation and the confidence that people had in it. People don't want to invest or start families, careers and businesses in a country that could be flipped on its head in the next election. They don't want to save for retirement under a regime that could plunder their piggy bank, and international organisations don't throw money into a nation that will give them nothing in return. So yeah, stability and confidence, no huge surprise there. But what if we looked a little bit deeper? Remember, Argentina was a wealthy and stable nation, so what was it that caused their decline while other similar nations like Canada and Australia sailed on with their prosperity intact to this day? Well to answer that, we have to look at the Argentine paradox. The actual reason behind Argentina's continued economic instability is a point of much debate between a host of economists. Just like the three decade long stagnation of Japan, nobody really knows for sure, but there are a few prevailing theories for both. Economists have primarily looked at the Argentinian economy in contrast to Australia and Canada, specifically who were all very similar entities at the turn of the last century. They all had modest populations, they had a large population of European settlers, and they all had a healthy collection of natural resources and farmland. So the question was, what made the difference? The first proposal put forward by Guardio de Tella, an Argentinian economist and businessman, was that the main difference between Argentina and other settler societies such as Australia and Canada was its failure to seek adequate alternatives to compensate for the end of geographical expansion with the definitive closing of the frontier. 
100 years ago, these countries were all far less utilised than they are today, where almost every square inch of the land is accounted for in some way, primarily agriculture. Back in the day, these nations all had policies that if you could go out and find a piece of unused land and make it work as a farm, it was all yours. The problem was that Argentinian farmland is far more arable than farmlands in Australia and Canada, and also by virtue of the country being smaller, much less available. This over time meant that Argentina had fewer farmers with more land and influence, rather than more farmers with less influence. Throw in a healthy dose of anti-competition and corruption and ta-da, suddenly the core industry of this nation is built on a fundamentally unstable platform. Another popular theory is that the nation's political climate and systems were not as well equipped to handle the new political landscape of an increasingly globalised world. Canada and Australia both effectively have political and legal systems passed down from the British Westminster style of government. Now this system is by no means perfect, but it does promote stability and balance of power above all else. It also promotes systems that are put in place to deal with international entities since, you know, the British were very into that. By contrast, Argentina had its political systems passed down to them primarily from Spain, which takes a more run and gun approach to international policies and has much less of an institutional emphasis on political stability. This is a slightly controversial theory, but for what it's worth, ex-British colonies have an average GDP per capita almost 50% higher than ex-Spanish colonies. But perhaps the most compelling argument came from a 1992 paper published by a research team at the University of Madrid which highlighted that property rights were the big thorn in the side of Argentina. Remember how the nation's assets kept on getting claimed by the state and then privatised and then claimed by the state and then privatised over and over again? Well, it turns out that that makes people really do not want to invest in your country, which is really bad. Borrowing for growth is an essential part of managing a healthy industrial economy, but that health relies heavily on what terms you get that borrowing. On an individual level, if you were a skilled worker like a doctor or a dentist or even a tradesman, and someone offered you a business loan at 2% interest over a 40 year period to open your own operation, you would be silly not to take that deal. So long as you provide a good service, you should easily be able to make those repayments and be wealthier in the long run as a business owner rather than an employee. On the other hand, if someone offered that same loan but it had to be paid back with 20% interest over a 5 year period, well suddenly that's a lot less tempting. Not only is the interest higher, but the entire thing needs to be paid back quicker, which means that those month to month repayments could easily be much more than the business will ever make. The same kind of toss up exists on a national level. Historically, very stable nations like the USA and yes, even Australia and Canada can borrow money at very low interest rates over a very long time. But if investors look at Argentina, they're going to see all of this nationalising business and be pretty scared to invest. If they do put their money into the nation, they are going to want higher returns and also going to want to have that money out quickly before some new government gets any idea. So in the long term, Australia and Canada got to be happy little business owners and Argentina had to forever be the national equivalent of an employee who couldn't catch a break due to their poor credit score. Of course, there were many historical footnotes that accelerated these problems, not least of which was starting a war with their longest and most loyal trading partner, but some combination of these three factors are the foundation of the nation's economic woes. Or at least they were. Because today, Argentina might be facing a very different problem, a currency crisis. The most recent crisis was kicked off as many have been before it, when it became obvious that Argentina would elect a new president that had a political stance that was more left wing than his incumbent opposition. A day after the primary election took place, the Argentinian stock market plummeted by more than 48%, as investors fear they could be in for yet another round of nationalisation. The difference this time, is that its currency had been thrown into jeopardy with no real plan to save it. In the early 1990s, the Argentine peso was pegged to the US dollar at a rate of approximately 3 to 1. This was enacted in an attempt to ward off inflation and it worked decently well. Currency pegs involved the home nation, in this case Argentina, keeping massive piles of foreign currency that they want to fix against, in this case US dollars. By being there to always honour that 3 to 1 exchange rate, the market more or less falls into line because no buyer will accept less than 3 pesos per $1 and no seller will accept less than $1 per 3 pesos. 
We have explained how currency pegs work in much more detail in our video on Entropia Universe of all things, so if you are still confused, go and watch that. But in short, so long as people believe that a government can honour the currency exchange they say, that's what the currency conversion will be and sometimes this works so well, the government doesn't even need to get involved. People will just exchange at the agreed upon price of their own volition. Unfortunately, this system fell apart during the last economic crisis in 2001 where people rushed to exchange their pesos to US dollars until the exchange board completely ran out of reserves, at which point the Argentine peso effectively became a free floating currency despite the government still trying their very best to prop it up. Those efforts include offering the highest interest rate in the world. Ever feel shortchanged by banks in your country only offering you half a percent interest rate on your savings, if you're lucky? Well, in Argentina, you can get as much as 25%. The only catch is, you need your deposits held in Argentine pesos. The reason this has become such a problem now is that this attempt to control the Argentine peso has done very little but introduced lots of American money into circulation. Given the historical instability of the nation and a rapidly declining value of the peso, people are moving to do more and more of their business in American dollars rather than Argentinian monopoly money. Today, Argentina effectively has a dual currency economy. Argentine pesos are still used for regular day-to-day -day activities like buying groceries or paying for a taxi, but major transactions like buying a house or a car or even getting paid are done in American dollars. If this becomes widespread enough, people will eventually not recognise pesos for anything and Argentina will become the largest economy in the world to not have control over its own currency. Now, using a foreign currency is fine for small nations that don't have the capacity to truly run their own internal economic policies. Places like Monaco and even Montenegro get away with this just fine. But if Argentina cannot raise taxes or provide fiscal stimulus or borrow in its own currency, it will effectively become a dead state walking, just one bump away from complete implosion. And if history is anything to go off, there are plenty of bumps ahead. Now it's time to put Argentina on the Economics Explained national leaderboard. However, we will now be doing that on our second channel that I bet most of you didn't know we had. Go and subscribe to that one as well because we will be using the channel a lot more in the new year than we have been for fun little economic curiosities that we aren't able to make full videos out of, as well as national rankings from here on out, plus, well, whatever else I feel like putting on there. Now, spoiler alert, Argentina is not going to get a great score, but will it be the bottom of the list? We'll have to find out. Fortunately, you can do a much better job of setting yourself up for prosperity by automating your savings with Acorns. Using their recurring contributions tool, you can make automated investments into your future every day, week or month. Just choose the amount that you want to invest, set the frequency and you're all set. One thing I love about Acorns is that the app not only helps you invest money, but earn money too. In the found money section, you can explore hundreds of brands that want to invest in your future. Brands that you probably already shop at, like Apple and Nike. Take the new M1 MacBook Pro for example. When you purchase through the Acorns app, Apple will invest 1.5% of your entire purchase into your portfolio. Or how about some new Air Jordans? Thanks to Acorns, Nike will invest 5% of your entire purchase into your portfolio. Speaking of purchases, Acorns is also the only company to offer a heavy metal debit card that saves and invests for you. Made out of tungsten metal, this thing is hefty and honestly, it just feels right. There are so many features of the card and we don't have nearly enough time to cover all of them in this video, so I encourage you to learn more by using the link in the video description below. It's time to make 2021 the year that you take your investments and retirement seriously with Acorns. Sign up now at acorns.com ee and they'll deposit $5 into your investment account to help you get started. That's acorns.com ee. As always, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in 2021. Bye.